talk about uh, multi beam sonar, geology, and uh, like fish. Rough image mapping fish. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, also have an announcement from Flo. She has informed me that there's a bicycle locked up on the handrail of the front steps of this building. And Joe says it needs to move right away because uh, something is going to happen to it. <laughs> so if you have your bike out there, uh, please uh, move it. OK. Uh, this is my now third seminar in this college. First one was in 1989 when I was interviewing. Second one was in the year 2000. It was the first seminar when the college became a college. It used to be a department. And that was my third one in 2013. I'm going to talk about what I've been doing the past 10 years and the past $6 million. And uh, what I've been doing is mapping uh, the seafloor in several places around the world, primarily around the West Florida Shelf and also in the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Uh, we uh, purchased a, a, a multi-beam sonar system, a high-resolution system that's 300 kilohertz, and it's able to resolve things on the order of centimeters on the seafloor. And uh, it turns out that our data that we collected in, in uh, the West Shelf of Florida has been used by NOAA to map out the marine protected areas on the West Shelf of Florida. The unfortunate aspect of this is that I get phone calls and emails on a regular basis asking for data from various places we've been. And it's become quite a, 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 burdensome, a, quite a, quite a burden. And so I'm trying to find a way to disseminate this data without uh, taking up uh, too much of my time. So here's an example from the West Florida Shelf. These areas in black are areas we've mapped. Uh, this is an old slide. We actually have covered a huge area in Pulley Ridge from previous surveys. Florida Middle Grounds, Steamboat Lumps, and a few other places. And we've been also closing in on this area and mapping deep corals off the west shelf of Florida down to 1,000 meters water depth with a lease system, which has a, a lower uh, frequency and a little bit uh, lower resolution. So in the old days, we used to make paper charts, and it was easy. You just rolled them up, stuck them in a, a map chart, and if somebody needed the data, you'd just photocopy the maps. But with multi-beam shallow water systems, there's so many maps you make, it's just impossible to keep track of and store. So we go to computer files. That sounds great, except when we go and put these data files in a national database, it still requires somebody to be a computer jockey to take those data files and create the data sets you want. So it's not the greatest thing for, say, example, somebody who's going to go out fishing or wants to go videotaping. They don't want to be an expert on multi-beam sonar. They just want to have the data. One of my students, Jennifer Brizaloa, in conjunction with Steve Murawski, have been working on creating an ArcGIS database. And that's the solution, is to put all these databases into an ArcGIS format. So if you want the data, you just simply go to the latitude and longitude you're interested in and select it. Problem is, there's about a dozen groups doing this type of work, and they all have different data sets. So for example, let's say you're going to be transiting from Tampa Bay out to the Florida Middle Grounds, there's a pipeline that's been surveyed. But out of the dozen of databases, there might only be two or three that are aware of this survey. Others may be aware of this, but not aware of this, and so forth. So there's still a problem about letting people know what data exist. Even in our own college, people aren't aware they have a digital database of the entire Tampa Bay. Some people know about it, some people don't. It's a well-hidden secret. The nice thing about ArcGIS is that you can put multiple layers. And for example, at the mud hole uh, west of uh, Fort Myers Beach, we have a beautiful map that took several uh, weeks to put together and showing uh, hydrothermal vents that are off the beach. These circular targets are the hydrothermal vents. This is the bathymetry. This is the backscatter. Using these two data sets, we can interpret the seafloor and create hard bottom and sands, limestone, and and sediments that exist in this area. This is work from Shea Salim's uh, thesis. Uh, and this data is also difficult to obtain unless they contact me and I dig it up. So uh, working with uh, Jennifer Brizolera, she has taken this ArcGIS data sets and put them into Google Earth. Now, this hasn't gone public yet, but our goal is to take all the data that we uh, are aware of lay them out on this Google Maps. So if you're going to go on a cruise anywhere in the world, 
you should be able to go on Google Map and see our data sets or other people's data sets. And this is what I'm proposing to the Gulf Council and to other agencies is that we put everything on Google Map as a broker, as a, a, a site locator of where data exists. And then by clicking on those data sets, you get a link to the ArcGIS system that someone's developed where you can actually get the data sets. So the Florida Middle Grounds is an, uh, took about two years to, to map. It's an area of very high relief. The depth ranges from 23 meters to 51 meters. It's been a database source for several publications, uh, one by Saul et al. in, in um, uh, University of Miami at Erasmus. Uh, David Mountson from our own college also has got a paper submitted uh, describing this area, looking at seismic data and the multi-beam multi bathymetry. I apologize if I'm having trouble speaking. I had to get up at 6 this morning to go teach a class in Tampa this morning, and I just returned. The nice thing about this multi-beam bathymetry sonar is that co-registered with each ping of bathymetry is also a ping of backscatter data. And the strong backscatter in this image represents strong uh, decibel returns suggesting a hard bottom and the lighter colors are places where sound is being muted by the sonar and is suggestive of sediments. This is not a fast rule but this is a general rule of thumb and if you overlay this uh, bathymetry and backscatter together they correlate very well. Up here in the uh, for there we go up here in this region here, we have sedimentary bed forms in the sand. So the resolution of the system is so great that you can actually see the bed forms both in the bathymetry and the backscatter. Now, what can we do with this nice set of ArcGIS? Well, we can actually navigate and plot the position of the ship as we go over the data. And when you're towing something like CBAS, the project that Steve Morawski has been working on with many people and engineers here at COT and, and many others, uh, Sarah Grasty, another student, uh, Eddie Hughes, and a few other people have been looking at videos along this pipeline. And there's lots of fish around this pipeline. But when you're towing something at two or three knots and you run into something that has a steep uprising, you need to be able to pull up the sled quick enough so you don't smash into whatever it is you're about to run into. By having this integrated, it allows um, the survey to work quite well. And here's, I'm going to show some examples of uh, how that worked out. So Jennifer is working on her master's, creating detailed benthic habitat maps um, of the Florida Middle Grounds, Madison Swanson, and Steamboat Lumps, the marine protected areas. Using high resolution bathymetry, um, uh, bathymetry and backscatter data with the uh, CBAS video, she's using both those data sets to try to uh, uh, calibrate the uh, ground truthing of the area. Also, the maps will also help confirm locations where fish are uh, aggregating and not aggregating. The next image shows where the sea bass have been towed through the Madison Swanson. They went along this very uh, high relief uh, edge berm of the Madison Swanson, very hard bottom, uh, some coral structure there as well. This is a merged image from the USGS and USF. This is what we did with our high resolution system and this is a lower resolution system merged together. So again, if we had been able to access the USGS data before we had set sail, we would have seen that uh, if we had just spaced a few more lines over, we wouldn't have this beautiful gap right through the middle of the, the reserve. Uh, one last thing before I move on. There were transects run over the Florida middle grounds east-west through here with the sea bass system allowing it to go up and down. And this GIS system on board the ship was imperative to avoid any collisions. They did lose the sea bass system here at one point, but they were able to go back and retrieve it. This bathymetry data in the ARC GIS system is accurate to one to two meters. So if you lose the thing, you know pretty closely where it was. These transects on the Florida middle grounds are actually uh, lined up with some seismic surveys. And so it allows us to do some geological interpretations as well with the video system. Steamboat Lumps uh, has uh, two sets of data through here, ranging uh, from 66 meters up down to 140, 150 meters. But it's interesting that in this shallow portion, it's an area of very uh, active uh, reproduction of the uh, groupers, the red, the red groupers, and I'll show you a slide of that shortly. 
During the cruise that uh, Jennifer was on, Eddie Hughes was also involved with it. And he's examining reef fish communities using an EK-60 sonar. This is a sonar that's a split beam aperture that's on the weather bird. It allows digital quantification of the backscatter of schools of fish. And by coupling the backscatter with what's observed on the video, we can start getting an estimate of what backscatter is seeing, trying to correlate it to what kinds of fish are being observed. This is not an exact science. It's, uh, this is all still active lines of research. Measuring independent target strengths of select species, for example, red snapper, through in-situ observations through the video. Um, and also, he's looking at using tethering cage experiments to have more control on, on what we're imaging. Now, acoustics have limitations, but when with uh, CBAS video and other um, techniques, we'll be able to provide a better picture of the uh, reef fish community. So some of the milestones of Eddie's work has been, uh, he started just working this spring 2013 with Kendra Daly as a co-advisor. He's participated on two uh, Weatherbird cruises, he's formed his committee and is drafting his research proposal, and has two training cruises uh, courses with EchoView software. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, he's got a full-time job. He's doing this part-time, so I appreciate his uh, active uh, uh, approach to his studies. This is an example of a school of fish overlying the seafloor using the EK-60. So this is just a vertical beam, but it's digital. And this can be played back through a software called EchoView. And so the training courses he was going to is allows him to take this data set and to play it back and try to correlate it with the video. So you have to measure the distance of how far back the video is. And so, for example, the image up above is the camera on the, uh, from the sea bass imaging those white spots for fish. There's also color images, but this one was done in black and white. This is EK-60 echogram. This is time running along left to right. And these areas that are floating above the seafloor are likely to be uh, schools of fish or other debris in the water. So there's the image of the seafloor. And the hard bottom uh, lines up with uh, the image below and on the video. And so where we see schools of fish, we think we see red snapper. And we can show this with a video. And so I'll go ahead. Oops, went too far. i going to get the mouse over the play button here. This is a video that uh, Eddie put together. So if you look carefully, there's a, a box here. This box is sliding over where we think the video is. And so as we approach the school of what we think is a school of fish is, we've seen red snapper in the video. So the correlation is working pretty well. This is all preliminary. Uh, we haven't even had a chance to ground truth, or I shouldn't say calibrate the EK-60. You have to take this lead sphere and pull it under the, the, the weather bird and try to get it lined up to calibrate it. Uh, the first time they did that, they uh, apparently lost the sphere, but they got a new one, and they're going to try again. <laughs> But the, the, the trick is, whenever you do these things, you're supposed to use a thin line so it doesn't interfere with the calibration. But uh, if you use a thin line, it's easy to break. So they find an alternative solution to protect losing it. I, I don't encourage my students to do this. I didn't know you actually climbed up there and took pictures from the A-frame. Or were you using a special well, video camera? Was, was from the, the, oh. the wire yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want anyone to try this at home. OK. Uh, the, the pipeline that runs across the shelf of Florida is really dramatic. And you can see it very well in this high resolution bathymetry. And it's, it actually helps us locate the real position of it. The positions that are advertised aren't exactly the same as what we actually observed. Some places are trenches, some places above the seafloor. Uh, it's a mixture of uh, uh, morphologies. A uh, new student who just started this fall, uh, Devin Firesinger, a uh, Von Rosensteel recipient, will be uh, working with Pam and I to look at using this uh, ArcGIS Methic Habitat map that Jennifer is uh, developing to look at uh, distributions of corals, shallow to deep corals throughout the West Shelf. And the data sets he's going to use are not just the big mosaics like we have in the Florida Middle Grounds, but these uh, transects. We have transects that go from the, the mouth of Tampa Bay to the northwest, to the west, to the southeast. It's like a spider web. And by looking at these high-resolution images I showed you in the previous slide, we can, uh, oops, went too far back. Uh, in this previous slide, we can actually start to delineate a benthic habitat map using high resolution data to control the information. There's also a lot of mosaics that haven't even been published yet. We just uh, were way too productive for our ability to publish. So we're trying to get caught up now. And the students that are working on this, uh, this is one of the areas that uh, is close to where the oil spill was, has some very uh, migratory bed forms through this region. It will be interesting to uh, 
to, to look at this region for a potential coring in the future and uh, uh, identify these regions. In addition to acoustics being used to map the seafloor and using acoustics to map fish, you can also use acoustics to look for backscatter in the water column. Uh, it's been well known in biology that there's a deep scattering layer that rises up at night, uh, at the nighttime. This dark shade here is night, and over here it's night. And during the day, the deep scattering layer tends to drop down. And we see evidence of the deep scattering layer dropping down from night to day. Through the day, we see a, a, a horizontal layer that continues right into the night, doesn't rise up too much, and we see other layers uh, dropping down through the middle of the day. What was very uh, interesting about this uh, backscatter layer, this is a 28 kilohertz sonar on the weather bird, is that uh, Norris Cromer from Eckerd College did a senior thesis on this work that he was able to show that the backscatter layer that we were observing here went through the day and night and continued on into the night. I don't have it all in there. It stayed horizontal. It didn't migrate back up to the surface. And it appeared to be casually associated uh, with the oil detections that uh, David Hollander did in the uh, water samples. So all these open circles represent no oil, but the dark circles represent oil. So we see it on the surface. We have a couple dark circles right up here, right there and there and there. These are the stations. The dashed lines represents the time duration. So this is time running on the x-axis. This is depth from zero meters down to 1,000 meters. This is a seafloor. And so here we have station seven. We have a little bit of oil there. And it's a smaller layer of oil than the backscatter. But then as you move off the shelf, it comes almost one to one. In some places, it's a little bit above where the backscatter layer is. In other places, the oil is observed in a lot of stations, but the backscatter layer is thin. We're trying to understand what, what's causing the, the differences here. But the, the nice thing is that the backscatter layer tends to correlate well. And so we've been able to interpolate across this region to get a minimum estimate of how much oil there was at that time based on the measurements that uh, Hollander made. We're working on a manuscript to submit uh, later this month. Uh, speaking of uh, steamboat lumps, Kerry Wall, along with David Manor, her advisor, and Brian and Donahue and myself, uh, used multiple surveys of the uh, steamboat lumps and were able to show that the number of fish holes that the groupers tend to kick up, these little circular targets on the, on the bathymetry, uh, like tilefish, uh, red grouper tend to uh, uh, make a circular target, something on the order of one to three meters wide, maybe half a meter deep. And they tend to habit these, uh, habitat these, they don't tend to migrate too much. And over a few years period, we were able to show a, a dramatic increase and we published those results. And you can see these things are very uniquely uh, identified in the, in the data. Some of these horizontal lines are artifacts in the, in the uh, ship uh, heave sensor, but everything else is, is real. And we've had videotapes uh, made there, and it's, it's really remarkable. So we can actually use uh, the seafloor image over time to document the uh, growth of uh, grouper population. And this has been documented by fishery data as well. So back in the old days when the USGS had uh, funded to do some mapping of the Pulley Ridge, the bathymetry was very uh, important in delineating this paleo shoreline. We continued to do the surveys with NOAA, with the fishery group there, and we found additional paleo shorelines further in deeper water. And so it appears that there's a whole series of these uh, washout bed forms and, and uh, crisscrossing patterns that are likely to have resulted when sea level was rising. Uh, this is a place called Howell's Hook. This is on the southwest portion of uh, the Florida pl platform. And this is a location, one of the deepest places where we have uh, photosynthetic corals existing. Uh, Further offshore, there's some deeper corals, but they're not photosynthetic. Oops, went too far here. Speaking of the keys, off the dry tortugas, NOAA and ourselves have mapped a great deal of areas here. We've published these uh, results in Mounds and all and Weaver et al. And again, these data sets are hard for people to get a hold of. You can go to the manuscripts, but they're not very usable in that format. Uh, speaking of shallow uh, coral reefs, uh, Josh Kilborn has been looking at fishery catches across the entire west shelf of Florida. He's modeling predatory fish distributions using lower trophic level community structure. And the, 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 the bottom line of this technique is that by looking at the fish catch, you can estimate what other fish will be in that same area. So he's looking at these uh, 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 co-relationships co using multivariate statistical modeling and GIS visualizations. And this will help fishery management decisions and also help cruise planning 
on where to go for certain types of fish. Uh, he has a poster outside his office. If you have more questions about that work, uh, certainly see him and he'll explain it better than I can. Uh, he has uh, been also a Von Rosenfield Fellow back in 2010. He's an MRA Fellow with NOAA, presenting at uh, two conferences at Norway and Iceland for the exploration of the sea. And uh, Scuba Nauts International Vice President and uh, working at the Benthic Habitat Mapping Keys in 2012 and working off longline surveys and sea map surveys in the Gulf of Mexico. And he's now doing some service in the Dean's Advisory Committee. But most importantly, he uh, has some results. And these results are that these colors represent different associations of types of fish. Uh, each number here represents a different fish. So if you go to the black circles, you have all kinds of fish located there. If you go to the red circles, you only have fishes one, two, and three, and so forth. And these uh, numbers are represented on his poster. I'm not going to go into any detail. I just wanted to give you a broad summary overview of what the students have been doing. Speaking of uh, other data sets, like I mentioned, there were people down the hall from me uh, who work in Tampa Bay who are unaware of this data set. Some of the students in the college were unaware of this data set. And I can make copies of this for anybody who wants them and uh, wants to use them. I know some of you know about it, but not everyone. So ex and if we could put this in Google Earth and ac access it in a much more straightforward way, it'd be great. Uh, Berman et al. Uh, first published uh, this data uh, in a paper he published uh, with his study of the Egmont Key. And so this data set's useful. They have nice images of what sea level might be like uh, during the flood stage. I know uh, Bob Weisberg has done a great deal of studies with this. For the students uh, starting this semester, you might want to look closely at this uh, where you're renting your locations. Uh, <laughs> John Gray is looking at bed form migrations underneath the Skyway Bridge. We have 10 years worth of data going in and out of the uh, Skyway Bridge. And we also have 10 years worth of ports data. And so these two data sets uh, can be used to make predictions, modeling the tides and currents into a 3D uh, model called Delft 3D. You can make predictions on what the bed forms will look like. And compare it to the high resolution bathymetry we've collected through the Skyway Bridge, uh, sometimes days apart, weeks apart, years apart, months apart. So we have different temporal time scales. And he can look at uh, bed form migration and actually also test for um, so the model will make predictive bed forms, and we can compare the actual bed forms that we'll see. I don't have an example of uh, data we've collected through there, but uh, that's what he'll be using. So to wrap up uh, on time talk, <laughs> presentation boot camp says don't go over time, so I will <laughs> wrap up my final solution here for uh, disseminating the data. The idea is to have a dedicated GIS data processor to build a living GIS map that will constantly grow with time and be available online. Now, there are multiple places that are doing this, so we're not expecting to cover everything with one uh, GIS map, but also have a rotating steering committee that locates these data at other locations and display everything on a Google Earth imagery so that anywhere in the world that someone needs to go, they can actually click on something and say, ah, oh, there's a map here, this is what it looks like, and I can get more layers and details from whatever source there is. And then, of course, work with bright, energetic students to fully utilize all these data that have been collected over this time. Yes? 